Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Carly Guzet? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Carly Lane Guzet was born on May 13, 2002. Her mother, Lindsay Fairley, and her father, Zachary Guzet, separated when Carly was three. They eventually divorced. Zachary remarried in 2009 to a woman named Melissa. They would go on to have two children together. Around the time they married, Carly and her brother moved in with Zachary and Melissa. In August 2018, the family moved to a neighborhood called White Mountain Estates, which is about 12 miles north of Bishop, California. This is between Yosemite National Park and the state of Nevada. The neighborhood was surrounded by desert, and on one side there were mountains in the distance. Carly attended Bishop Union High School and had a part-time job working for a title company where Melissa worked. When Carly was 16, she started dating a boy named Donald Arrowwood. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance. On October 12, 2018, at about 6 p.m., Carly requested permission from Melissa to attend a football game at the high school. Carly's true intention was to go to a party with her boyfriend. She lied to her stepmother. Melissa gave her permission based on what Carly had told her. Melissa called Carly at about 8 p.m. and asked her if she needed a ride home from the game. Carly told her that her boyfriend would be driving her home. At the party, Carly's mood changed dramatically, and she started to panic. At 8.30 p.m., she called Melissa and asked to be picked up. When Melissa arrived, Carly had a look of terror on her face. Melissa said that Carly's face was ghost-like, and her pupils were dilated. Carly was frantic and paranoid. She told her mother that she lied about going to the game and admitted to using marijuana. She also said that she was very scared. As Melissa drove them home, Carly expressed concerns that the car was going to kill her. She changed seats several times, I imagine in an effort to reduce the perceived risk. At home, Melissa and Zachary both believed Carly's mood was unstable. One moment she would be hiding in a corner, the next moment she was telling them how much she loved them. She seemed to be frightened of her cell phone, and she did not want her parents getting too close to her. Her parents inquired as to what was wrong. Carly said she did not know. After dinner, Carly's erratic behavior was less pronounced, but she was still paranoid, disoriented, and anxious. Even though her parents were aware that Carly may have had some type of adverse reaction to marijuana, they decided that medical care was not needed. They determined that she was in no immediate danger. Eventually, Carly went to her bedroom, where she read from the Bible, colored, and painted her toenails. She appeared to be less anxious, but her behavior was still not normal. Melissa pulled out her own cell phone and started audio recording Carly. Her intent was to teach Carly a lesson, like Carly would listen to the recording later and realize how being under the influence of drugs was not flattering. After this, Melissa and Carly talked from about 10.30 p.m. to 3 a.m., now on October 13, 2018, at which time they both fell asleep. At around 5.45 a.m., Melissa woke up and saw that Carly was sitting next to her, writing on a piece of paper. Melissa went back to sleep at around 6 a.m. When she woke up at 7.15 a.m., Carly was gone. Melissa searched the residence and looked in the backyard, but there was no sign of Carly. She entered her vehicle and drove around the area to continue the search, Melissa encountered a neighbor who told her that he spotted a teenage girl around 6.30 to 7 a.m. walking south. Zachary also used a vehicle to search for Carly. He drove up to a high point and looked to see if she was walking in the desert. After failing to find Carly, Melissa called 911 and reported that her daughter was missing. After the police arrived, they found Carly's cell phone, money, and glasses. There was no sign of forced entry into the home. The police had a discussion with Carly's boyfriend, Donald, and another boy named James Doolin. 
The party that Carly attended the night before was at the residence of James. Donald and James said that everybody at the party used the same marijuana, and no one had an unusual reaction other than Carly. James drove Carly and Donald back to Donald's residence. At that point, Carly became increasingly paranoid and ran away. This is probably when she called her mother to get picked up. Donald said that he tried to reach Carly a few times before going to sleep. He was home all night. Donald's father corroborated his alibi. James said that he went back to his home and did not leave all night. The police reviewed surveillance video captured at the residence of James, where the party was. On October 12, Carly, Donald, and James arrived to the residence at 6.04 p.m. They left at 8 p.m. The surveillance video supports the story provided by Donald and James. The police seized the marijuana that had been at the party. Tests revealed it had not been laced. The police were interested in where the marijuana came from, but Donald and James would not reveal much information about the source of the marijuana. Investigators spoke to three witnesses who saw a girl matching Carly's description on the morning of October 13. The first witness was the neighbor who Melissa spoke to on the morning of the disappearance. He said that he saw a teenage girl wearing a white t-shirt, gray sweatpants, and carrying a white piece of paper in her hand. She was walking south at about 6.30 a.m. The second witness offered the same description of a teenage girl, except this witness saw her walking west toward Route 6 at 7.15 a.m. She was not far from where the first witness said that she was, but of course she was walking in a different direction. The third witness saw a teenage girl at about 7.20 a.m. She was standing on the east side of Route 6 near White Mountain Estates Road. From these three witness accounts, the police determined that Carly walked south from her home at about 6.30 a.m. She proceeded west on White Mountain Estates Road and disappeared on Route 6 sometime after 7.20 a.m. A massive search effort was launched involving multiple law enforcement agencies. The search radius was 10 miles. There was no sign of Carly. In January of 2019, James Doohan pleaded guilty to contributing to the delinquency of a minor in connection with Carly's marijuana use. In the spring of 2021, a tipster contacted the police saying they had information about Carly's disappearance. They claimed that she had been picked up on Route 6. She was driven to a small mining town in Nevada called Tonopah, which is about two hours away from her home. She was seen partying with other individuals. The tipster supplied a description of a vehicle. The police searched this vehicle and said that they had a person of interest connected to it. They considered the tipster to be legitimate. The tipster said that they waited so long to come forward because they had been using drugs. At the time making this video, the police are actively investigating this lead. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Carly was described as well-liked, introverted, fun-loving, and possessing a great sense of humor. When she was in high school, she had behavioral problems. Carly's grades dropped dramatically, and she was caught using marijuana at school. Her marijuana use increased after she started her relationship with Donald. Carly was in a special program at her school for students with behavioral problems. Just a few days before her disappearance, her friends witnessed what they referred to as episodes. Carly was concerned that people were tracking her using her cell phone. This makes it seem as though she was paranoid prior to the night before her disappearance. Item number two, some people believe that Melissa and Zachary may have had something to do with Carly's disappearance. Melissa in particular has been the target of quite a bit of suspicion. There are a few reasons for this. For example, Melissa was interviewed by a reporter and told them that on the morning of Carly's disappearance, she woke up in her own bedroom, walked to Carly's bedroom, opened the door, and saw that Carly was missing. The problem is, she told investigators that she fell asleep in Carly's bedroom. Melissa later explained that she lied to the reporter. She implied it was to protect the integrity of the investigation. Another inconsistency is related to what Carly was wearing when she disappeared. Witnesses said that she was wearing a white t-shirt and gray sweatpants. Melissa said she was wearing a sweater and skinny jeans. 
This discrepancy can easily be explained. Carly may have changed her clothing before leaving. For quite a while, Melissa did not release the audio recording she made of Carly. This made it seem like Melissa was hiding something. She eventually released it to the show People Magazine Investigates. I'll talk about the content of the recording in a moment. The police said that there is no reason to believe that Melissa and Zachary were involved in Carly's disappearance. Investigators examined various electronic devices owned by the couple and found the data on them corroborated their stories. Item number three is the content of the audio recording of Carly. Here is a summary. The recording contained a conversation between Melissa and Carly. Carly said to Melissa, you are going to kill me. Melissa pointed out how that was ridiculous. Carly said, I'm eating the devil's lettuce. Melissa indicated that the lettuce was from the grocery store. Carly responded, I don't know why, I'm just thinking that. Melissa asked why Carly would think it was the devil's lettuce. Carly said, because I'm just thinking all this demonic stuff. I can't help it. Carly seemed interested in whether or not Melissa was going to call 911. Melissa explained that she would call that number in an emergency. After Carly said she was scared, she and her stepmother exchanged I love yous. The recording ended with Melissa saying, it's going to be okay. I don't think there's anything on this recording that supports the idea that Melissa was somehow involved in Carly's disappearance, but I can understand why Melissa did not want to release the recording. It makes it seem as though she really should have known to call 911. Carly was exhibiting signs of psychosis. That doesn't mean she was definitely psychotic, but it was cause for alarm. One could argue that any reasonable person would have sought help for a teenager exhibiting those symptoms. Now moving to my final item, number four. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Carly Gouzet had difficulty adjusting to life as a teenager. She turned to marijuana and perhaps to other drugs to cope with her problems, to experience pleasure, or to fit in socially. Her drug use increased over time and she lost control of it. She believed that she was seeing demons, but her drug use was the demon. On October 12th, Carly experienced cannabis-induced psychosis, or she used other drugs like cocaine or methamphetamine, which are more likely to cause psychosis. But either way, her substance use led to a break from reality. She experienced fear, anxiety, paranoia, and believed that she had encountered satanic salad. For some reason, Melissa and Zachary decided not to obtain assistance for Carly. Melissa appeared to be more interested in teaching Carly a lesson than in getting her help. This was a catastrophically unproductive decision. Carly's safety should have come first. On the morning of October 13, Carly was still psychotic. She walked out of her home and made her way to Route 6, where someone picked her up in a motor vehicle. Carly may have been killed by the person who picked her up. She may have been dropped off somewhere else and killed later, or she may have survived. Unfortunately, the most likely outcome is that she did not survive. I believe that Carly worked alone to get herself to Route 6. She was not the victim of a crime at that point. She became a victim when she was picked up or sometime after that. Carly was an easy target due to her mental health crisis. Now moving to my final thoughts. This case involves a combination of several unlikely events. A teenage girl developing psychosis, escaping her house without being detected, making her way to a roadway, and encountering bad actors. I think the lesson learned in this case is that when a person is in an altered state, including being psychotic, they need assistance, not judgment. A teachable moment is only productive when the person who is doing something wrong survives long enough to learn from it. Those are my thoughts on the case of Carly Guzet, Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.